Good evening. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Dennis Ward. Nunavut remains clear with no active cases of COVID-19 in the territory. Over 600 people have now received the vaccine and no one has had a bad allergic response. Since the vaccine was introduced at the end of December, Nunavut Premier Joe Sivikita has been urging Nunavut to ignore anti-vaccine misinformation that is being shared on social media. Today he tried a different tactic. He played a recording of an RVET woman on the local radio station. Her husband died from COVID-19 and she wants everyone to get the vaccine. You all know that I recently lost my husband to COVID. My husband, Lucid, did not receive the vaccine, so he had nothing to fight COVID with. We said, please, please get the COVID shot. Don't go through what I had to go through. And I'm going to watch your loved ones pass away. It's not a joke. COVID is not a joke. In Ottawa, federal officials say they are considering delaying second doses of the vaccine so more people can get the initial shot. This comes a day after it was reported that residents of a long-term care home in Quebec became infected with COVID-19 despite having already been vaccinated, raising questions as to the effectiveness of the first dose and whether it's a good idea to delay second doses. Dr. Howard New, Canada's Deputy Chief Public Health Officer, wouldn't comment on the cases in the Quebec home, but says cases are rising to the point of overloading Canada's health care capacity. And the vaccinating more people with initial doses may reduce the current strain on health care. Public Health Canada says vaccine reinforcements are on the way. Now, we're about phase two, uh, the, the next quarter. Um, also uh, called the ramp up phase. The quantity of doses arriving in Canada is anticipated to average more than a million doses a week for both currently approved vaccines starting in April. A global team of researchers have arrived in Wuhan, China, conducting an investigation into COVID-19's origins. This comes amid uncertainty. Beijing might try to prevent embarrassing discoveries. The group sent to Wuhan by the World Health Organization was approved by President Xi Jinping's government after months of diplomatic wrangling. A government spokesperson says they will exchange views with Chinese scientists the WHO says they will compare their evidence with the Chinese government's evidence. We will look into epidemiological uh, data. Uh, we will uh, uh, look uh, into, into uh, evidence that had been already collected by Chinese counterparts. And we will define what else needs to be done. So we really have to uh, uh, go back, try to uh, uh, get the data and, and records of early patients. Uh, try to see uh, epidemiological trees uh, in those days and really try to, uh, to, to, get, to get more information. The WHO says that while many believe the use of bats in a Wuhan wet market is the cause of the spread, there may have been cases of COVID-19 in the human population before the market was identified as a spreading event. A mother in B.C. is desperate for answers in the case of her missing daughter. As Tina House explains, she has come up with a unique way to get more tips that may help in the search. Hey, you guys want some goodie bags? Yeah, this is my daughter. She's been missing since September. Yeah. Oh, is it? Yeah. Sheila Poorman is hoping that by appealing to someone's sweet tooth that they may take this bag of chocolates and candy, as well as this business card with a picture of her missing daughter, Chelsea Poorman. This is the last picture that Chelsea and her sister Paige took the night she disappeared. That's Chelsea on the left. She has been missing since September the 5th, 2020. That night, Chelsea and her sister Paige decided to go to Granville Street to have a fun night on the town. Just after midnight, they went to a friend's house to visit on Granville Street. 
Shortly after midnight, Chelsea left on her own. Her sister called her, and Chelsea said that she'd met a new guy. That was the last time anyone heard from her. So her mother and family members continued to comb the streets, looking for any information about where she is and what happened to her. I still go out there on my way to work. And when I come home, I'm always looking for her. Yeah. I hand these out when I'm on the bus or just walking on the street. I always make sure that I have a bag or two, hoping that somebody, you know, recognizes her and knows her location. The family is also announcing a $10,000 reward for information in locating Chelsea. She was last seen wearing a gray sweater, black lace crop top, black jeans, brown knee-high boots, and a beige purse. She is 24 years old, 5 foot 3, and walks with a slight limp. We love you, we miss you, and we just want you home. We want you to come home to us. And if anybody's seen her, you know, to call the tip line, to go on their Facebook page, Chelsea, you dearly miss. We just want you to come home. Her family says Chelsea had only been in Vancouver a short while and didn't know anyone here. Police are asking for you to call them if you know anything about the disappearance of Chelsea Poorman. Tina House, APTN National News, Vancouver. The Northwest Territories hold some of the highest rates of violence against women in the country, and survivors face unique challenges as they flee abusers and on their road to healing. Charlotte Moore Jacobs brings us this story of one woman's journey and her future hopes of the NWT. Susie Kuniyuna is a survivor. I'm free of him. It feels good to be free of him. I'm not tied down to him anymore. This apartment is her fresh start, and in the few years she's been here in Yellowknife, it's become home. But over the pandemic, Kuniuna says she's witnessed violence against women on the other side of her living room wall. We're not supposed to do, be doing laundry after 11. So, you know, you can tell when there's lots, lots of noise in there, sometimes arguing. Many times there's a woman screaming. It's when those women are screaming for help. It's triggering, and she says with the cold weather, there's been more homeless and vulnerable women coming into the apartment and enduring violence from partners. Across the country, medical associations and women's organizations have been reporting higher rates in domestic violence due to COVID-19 restrictions like self-isolation. The NWT is no exception. There's been more emergency protection orders given out. APTN National News spoke with women's expert Dr. Patrice Moffat over the summer on the topic as she led research on prevention and risk assessment. We don't have police in every community. Now some of the communities are very small. We don't have victim services in every community. We don't have shelters. We don't have safe houses. So those just right there are huge. Last fall, the territorial government set up an interdepartmental working group to review programs providing family violence supports. Moffat says it's a good start, but wants to see immediate action, like implementing screening questions in government resources that women access. Um, could be in the emergency department at the hospital, because people may be very reluctant, but if you ask the question every time and if people become more trusting of the health care professional. And then what we have to do as well, um, even, if, even if once we have these tools in place, what are we going to do about it when someone says, yes, I feel I'm in a vulnerable position. Kuniuna agrees. When she suffered a stroke and had to be medevaced out of her home of Cambridge Bay, her abuser was assigned as her medical escort, even though RCMP had been called just days before over threats he would kill her. But coming to Yellowknife was a blessing in disguise. When Kuniuna regained the ability to talk the next day, she told the doctor, and victim services got involved. Her abuser was dismissed of escort duties and sent back north while she transitioned to a women's shelter. 
And that was my healing project. She made this quilt during her stay as she received the help that she needed to get back on her feet. When I got it done, it felt like that I had stitched my shattered heart back together. Charlotte Mart Jacobs, APTN National News, Yellow Knife. Time to step aside for a quick break, but coming up we'll hear why the Manitoba Métis Federation believes it needs a say in what happens to a landmark in Winnipeg. Welcome back to Northern Saskatchewan now, where a young man in Wollaston Lake has been keeping himself busy during this pandemic by playing guitar online. In this encore presentation of a story Priscilla Wolf brought us last November, this young man is making quite a name for himself. Seventeen-year-old Dylan Gadsden Larry hasn't let a disability set him back from pursuing music as a hobby and hopefully a career. He was born with one hand, and the teenager from Wollaston Lake, Denunsala Nation, has been uploading videos of himself playing the guitar. I am a self-taught musician. I did teach myself over two years now. Before the pandemic, he was attending high school and joined a band as lead guitarist, but that was put on hold. He's now doing online classes and keeping himself busy with music. It does keep me pretty busy, but we are very far up north. I think we're about eight to nine hours uh, north of Prince Albert. So we're pretty far up north. And with kind of uploading videos and teaching myself music, it does keep me pretty preoccupied. Gaz and Larry says he's like any other teenager, and he has struggled with self-confidence. His message to other youth, find something creative. It's great to have an outlet. Like, to push yourself into like whether it just be punching a punching bag or throwing stuff at a wall or playing music little things like those can really help a lot he says he keeps pushing himself to learn more and practice his instruments i got into playing much more complicated songs i got into learning guitar solos teaching myself music theory which i still can and and then after guitar i've, I've been getting into playing the drums. Gaz and Larry aspires to one day share his music in public. I hope to get in front of a crowd. Small, maybe a small stage or big stage. I just hope to get back on stage and play the music I love in front of everybody. For now, the internet is his big stage. Priscilla Wolf, AP10 National News, Saskatoon. Amazing guitar playing there. A committee has been created to discuss opportunities for the future use of the historic Hudson's Bay building in downtown Winnipeg. It closed down for good just before the Christmas holiday, but Manitoba Métis Federation President David Chartrand says the MMF are not on the committee and have not been contacted for it. He joins us now to discuss. President Chartrand, thanks for being with us. Uh, why do you believe the MMF should be on this committee to decide what goes into the space at the Bay? Well, I, I think it's uh, clearly there's such an historical connection between us and the Bay, of course, the Métis Nation, the young nation of uh, over 300 years old. And when the Bay, of course, uh, ventured out for the fur trade, uh, there was a lot of interaction that did take place and uh, some good, some bad. And uh, there was definitely some challenging times with the Bay. and. Uh, and, and their business ventures, and, and same with our business ventures. So there was a clash, of course, that occurred, uh, but a lot of our people also worked uh, in that fur industry and uh, probably uh, uh, had uh, strong relations inside the economy of the Bay. Uh, at the same time, while well, there's others who are still practicing free trade and not letting the Bay control them. There are supposedly two members on the committee that have indigenous descent, is that enough? No, that, in fact, I'm not being disrespectful to the First Nations. I'm, I'm sure they should be on that committee. Uh, the other one, of course, uh, Ro uh, Councillor Rollins, that's a question yet still being debated whether she's Indigenous at all. And that's not up to me to judge that. That's not my problem. But uh, clearly, there's no one from the Métis. And that's why we raised issue with this and saying, this, is, you've got to be, this has got to be a mistake. Uh, you wouldn't be inviting us to this committee to share uh, our, our uh, potential vision 
and recommendations on some of the future, what this building will look like. And Dennis, uh, I knew you're Métis, and uh, you would have been a proud owner. We were also looking at one time venturing to see if uh, MMF would actually pursue buying the bay. Uh, but after all of the uh, engineering studies and all their information, even the committee that's going to be in place is going to be challenged. So there have been different reviews and studies. Uh, you can't make it really into apartments or, or living quarters because of the space, the design of it. Uh, there's so many uh, challenges you will face. So what, what do you do with a, an historical building of that nature? We already have our landmark owning the Bank of Montreal and, and right in Portage and Maine, established in 1913. So, uh, and we're going to build a hotel on, on Fort and Portage. So you're, that's big news. That's first time news you're hearing. Uh, we bought a building already. So we'll be building a hotel there. Uh, so definitely we want to uh, uh, make sure we, we have some at least re remnants of uh, being involved in something some, so, such historic for us, and the connection as I said, it was good and bad. Despite its prime location and the massive size of this store that's been there since 1926, it has been valued uh, basically at zero dollars. So what do you think should be done with this building? You know, Dennis, if somebody is to, like we had, I said, we said our own cabinet was looking at different strategies. Uh, we had our economic engines uh, working at the Federation, figuring out if we were to pursue the building, what can we do with it? And that was one of the things we were talking about first designing potentially a living quarters and uh, making apartments and, uh, and, uh, and unique apartments. Uh, so once we got the engineering uh, reports and studies that have been done, uh, we found that's probably not going to be feasible. Uh, so, you know, it was designed for what it is, uh, a landmark. It was designed to be uh, a retail a giant, uh, to send its message to its power base based on its size and its magnitude, its history. That's what the message of the building really resonates with, uh, with everyone. So that, the deci decision of what it could be, I'm, I'm, I want to put my two cents in there of our historical connection for sure, uh, but I don't have the answer for that right now, and, and I, I would be willing to sit down with all of the people appointed to see uh, if more dialogue takes place, uh, more ideas would come from us. As I said, uh, we're, we're in the business of building right now, and uh, definitely there's, the, there's not a doubt in my mind there's a, a very important aspect that we can, role we can play, and that we should definitely be doing our part uh, given the historical connection of the Bay. And President Chartrand, I understand you have heard back from uh, Mayor Brian Bowman's office about your letter? Yes, thank you for that question. We did, and that, uh, we have, we're having a meeting, a uh, phone discussion, of course, I think we're Zoom, uh, myself and, and Mayor Bowman, on Friday at 10 o'clock. And I've also heard from uh, two city councillors already uh, about this issue, and they both agree that the Métis should be sitting on this committee. And, uh, in fact, uh, uh, I, I take it so seriously, Dennis, I, I, it might just be me, myself, uh, that'll, that instead of me appointing somebody, I might just represent MMF and the Métis government. And sit there or it's going to be somebody with uh, architectural and engineering background uh somebody that knows the metis nation well in the history uh that'll be appointing on there well president chartran we'll leave it there but appreciate you taking some time for us here thank you very much dennis and you be safe out there you too thank you well do you have ideas for what should happen to the bay building in downtown winnipeg here's how you can continue the conversation you can send your emails to news at aptn.ca or leave a comment on aptnnews.ca. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. Time now to step aside for one more quick break, but stick around. Welcome back. Time now to take a peek at our photo of the day. And it was a foggy day in Winnipeg, captured by Jared Delorme. Seen peeking through the fog is the top of the Human Rights Museum, located in the historic forks of downtown Winnipeg. Be sure to send us your photos along with any details to share at aptn.ca, and your photo might be selected for our next photo of the day. Well, let's take a look now at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, plus two showers for Halifax, zero in Charlottetown. Minus 11 in Nain, minus eight with snow for Kujuac. One below in Montreal, Quebec City, and Saguenay. Plus four with showers in Toronto, snow and minus two for Sault Ste. Marie. Minus seven with flurries in Thunder Bay, snow and zero for Sioux Lookout. 
Minus 11 in God's Lake, 6 below for Norway House. Zero in Winnipeg, minus 6 in Dauphin. Minus 6 in Yorkton, Regina and Saskatoon. Minus 4 with snow in Meadow Lake and Buffalo Narrows. Picking up in northern Alberta, plus 1 in Fort McMurray, 4 above and sunny in Grand Prairie. Plus 5 for Medicine Hat, 3 in Edmonton. Showers in 10 for Vancouver, plus 1 with snow in Kamloops. Plus 4 for Prince George, 0 in Deese Lake. Minus 22 with snow in Old Crow, 2 below for Whitehorse. Minus 12 and snow in Yellowknife, 17 below with flurries in Norman Wells. Minus 26 in Saks Harbor and Politak, 21 below in Colville Lake. Minus 20 in Chesterfield, 25 below for Cambridge Bay. Minus 26 in Resolute, snow and 23 below in Arctic Bay. Well, it's Thursday and that means Nation to Nation is coming up right after the news. Here's host Todd Lamoran with a look at what's coming your way. Thank you. We'll once again be putting Northern Ontario's notorious St. Anne's Residential School under the political spotlight. Survivors there have fought for years in court to get justice after suffering years of torment there. Longtime advocate NDP MP Charlie Angus tells us why the federal government needs to cease and desist all forms of litigation. As well, I talked to a survivor of St. Anne's, Evelyn Corkmaz. Although it's been decades since she was a student there, she is still triggered to remembering details of the abuse. You have your good days and you have your bad days. And there's, you know, things that uh, make you remember, like smells, sounds, my speech impediment. So it's something I deal with on a daily basis. And I speak to child welfare advocate Cindy Blackstock about the latest judicial review of a Canadian Human Rights Tribunal order asked for by the federal government. That's coming up in a few minutes. I'll see you then. Sad news to leave you with tonight as we at APTN National News are bidding farewell to one of our family members. Bob Mackishon was the director of our newscast for many years. He's the father of Jill Mackishon, CTV's national news reporter in Winnipeg. He came to us from CTV's Winnipeg and Regina stations, and among other accomplishments, Bob helped us bring the 2010 Winter Olympics to our audience. He taught us many trade secrets that we still use to this day. Bob passed on yesterday at his home. So long, Bob. We're going to miss you. Thanks for all that you did for us. That is all the time we have for your APTN National News for this Thursday. For more, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great night.